us to go to our final topic, which yes. is diplomacy. Yes. You are at the side. You do very long service in public administration, but also in, in diplomacy. And I just want to pick some elements, and uh, that is uh, walking backwards. There's a particular one that I found interesting, and that is your appointment to the East African Cooperation yes. as the Executive Secretary. Yes. This came after Professor Philip Mbithi yes. turned down his appointment. Uh, app appointment. Yes. Were there any reasons given as to why Philip Mbidi turned down the appointment? To tell you the truth is that when Philip Mbidi was announced as the, the person to be the executive secretary for East African Cooperation, the first, I was in, uh, in, in uh, New York as the permanent representative. And I told my staff, this is the best news ever because that job requires a person of that caliber. Uh, because remember, this was to re, you know, uh, you know, reestablish the East African cooperation. Because for 20 years, we had a vacuum. After the collapse of the first East African community in the year 1977, for 20 years, without even trade, with the, our biggest partner, I mean, neighbor here, the Tanzania, the border was closed. Kenya, Tanzania border was closed for 20 years. No trade, nothing. So when that announcement was made, I was the happiest person. I told my staff. But we went home, and when I was asleep very late in the night, I think it was like uh, two in the night, a telephone called. And uh, the secretary from the other side said, yeah, this is uh, Sari Kosge's office, PS's office. I said, who are you? Who, who? Oh, this time, <laughs> uh, you know we are asleep. I said, no, no, we have an urgent matter to discuss. You know when people are here, 2 o'clock could be midnight in America or four, uh, 10 o'clock would be midnight in America. So he told me, now, you know you have been appointed the same day, uh, executive secretary for East African Cooperation. I said, but not me. I told them, not me. He's busy, Professor Bithi, not me. He told me, you talk to the, to the, to the PS. So I talked to the Kosge called me to be, you know, congratulations, you have been told, Sally, what are you talking about? Is Mbidi who was appointed, not me. He told me, no, I'm telling you, it's you who has been appointed, and we like you to prepare as quickly as possible to, to come and also accept the, 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 the nomination. So that was very interesting. But me, I was very excited about the appointment. I liked it because I, I, I wanted to be given that type of a chance. Yes. And you arrive in Arusha, a town that has a 20-year era of distrust yes. between Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Where did you start? Actually, the town was in, even the town itself was dead because before that, it was vibrant because of the East African community, but after the community collapsed, the town really went down. But now it was being revived by the International Court on Rwanda genocide. So they had started, you know, there, are, there was quite a bit of money in the town, uh, you know, renting houses, what, what not, and new businesses coming up to cater for the international community, which was in Arusha. So when I went there, uh, the first thing was to, to meet my two deputies. One was Ambassador Kazaura from, Uga, from Tanz Tanzania. We had worked together in, uh, in, in um, Brussels, but at that time I was first secretary when he was ambassador in uh, Brussels of Tanzania. And in Dr. Nahamia was from Uganda. He was director of uh, 
in uh, I think he's uh, he was director of uh, a, a strategic planning secretariat for the government. So they came and we we were all happy to be given that assignment. But there was nothing. There was no secretariat. The secretariat, I think there were there were I think two people. There was no furniture. There was nothing. Uh, so we are told now to to start. So the people came even to prepare for for the ceremony of us swearing in, being sworn in. Was well, the Tanzania Minister of Foreign Affairs, which was organizing the conference rooms and the meetings, you know, and issuing invitations. So that's how we started. That's how we started. And you built on and uh, to all the way to the uh, stadium one afternoon when the East African community now yes. uh, uh, came back. Yes. How much work went into that and what was the deal breaker? What was that that really uh, sorted out the 1977 problem? You know, there was a lot of suspicion because I told you the border was closed between Kenya and Tanzania. And on the Uganda side, we had a military presence around the border because Idi Amin had threatened uh, to take some parts of the country of Kenya. Idi Amin was very aggressive. Uganda had already gone into war with Tanzania. So there were, it, it was a very difficult, I think that was the lowest point in the history of East Africa. But then when new presidents came in, President Moy, President Mukapa, and Museven decided to re-establish. I think they started around 91, that's the time they passed resolution in Rusaka somewhere, after mediation of some sort, the consultations. You see, they were going even to meet in Rusaka, <laughs> not here. Uh, they came up with an idea of re restarting cooperation. Now, when our, between that 91 and the 96, when I was appointed, there had been a series of meetings, interministerial meetings, and they had listed about like 13 areas of cooperation. Just a list. Cooperating in trade, cooperating in tourism, cooperating in agriculture, cooperating in uh, things like environment, cooperating in uh, transport, those type of things. Just a list of 13 things. That's what they had agreed, nothing more than that. So when, when, I, when I was appointed, I, on the day I was being sworn in, and when I was sworn in, we talked a bit, quite a lot, with uh, the Kenyan minister, uh, Dr. Onyonka, Dr. Zachary Onyonka. Yeah. I knew him very well because we had traveled globally for attend a lot of meetings together. So he told me, this cooperation needs a strategy, a master plan. That's what he called it, a master plan. If you can come up with that mass plan, then at least we can have a basis for drive, for moving on. And then uh, he went back home. After about three days, I went to see him. I came all the way to Nairobi to see him, to discuss more about what, he was, what was in his mind. Uh, then he told me, no, the structures we create are very important because if we stick on a summit and these people quite often disagree and they don't talk to each other, then everything gets paralyzed. So perhaps we can have structures without the summit, like ministers conduct. Then I told him, minister, you know, ministers have limitations and they can only go to a certain level. If the boss is not a part of that, you cannot be sure we shall go very far. So as I was going back, I was thinking, thinking, thinking. Then I said, really, what we need is uh, 
you know, a, a, a strategy, a development strategy for the, for the community. So I went and the next day morning I called my, my two deputies and uh, our macroeconomist called Kiguta, was called Kiguta. I said, I have had a discussion with the minister Onyonka and this is what he thinks, but this is what I, I would advise myself. And uh, it's very important that we think seriously about a strategy. But probably let's meet in tomorrow morning when we have thought and come up with ideas. So when we met the next day, we discussed all areas of possible co cooperation. Then we asked all the areas of possible cooperation. And I said, let us not go to areas where there is no, there will be difficulties of agreement. I, I, I just want to uh, briefly get your recollections on um, uh, how the whole trust issue was addressed. Uh, because in the 77 breakup, Kenya took the bulk of the blame yes. that uh, Charles Njonjo uh, brought <laughs> down the East African, East African community, and that planted the mistrust. Actually, actually the, the, you know, that's what people were blaming Njonjo, but the problem was not Njonjo at all. Uh, the problems of the community started with, um, you know, the socialist socialist policy of Tanzania because they wanted to go in a certain way, socialist uh, types of uh, way, which was not very easily compatible, compatible with the, the, the programs for the community. Then in Uganda, they started Common Man Charter and Obote, which was also socialist. And Kenya was more Capitalist. Capitalist, call it mixed economy. So the, you know, the, the, the emphasis were different. Now, the whole thing, of course, was now uh, ruined by ascendancy of Idi Amin into power. Idi Amin started threatening Tanzania, started threatening Kenya. So even the meetings, because he was accusing Tanzania of harboring or supporting or both. So even the meetings of the community now, summits were started to dwindle. And even um, some of the some of the urgent matters like approval budget and the tribute were getting delayed. Now what caused the collapse of the community, immediate collapse, was um, the you know the, the at one point Tanzania and a big, a big meeting. He had invited guests from all over to come and, uh, and uh, see, I think, a declaration of the Arusha declaration. The Arusha declaration. Yes. Then on that, 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 at that time, National Bank of Kenya grounded Kenya Airways because it was not paying the loans that they had borrowed from National Bank to purchase the aircraft. So they took hold of the aircraft. Uh, Tanzania felt it was like Kenya was fighting them. So they decided now to close the border. And that now caused and a lot of problems. Which, which version is true? Because you have, you're giving us the National Bank version. Yes. But there is the version of uh, Charles John and Jeroge Mungai. Yes. Grounding the Kenya Airways uh, uh, flights. Well, that's what they say. That's what they, what they say. But the fact is that the bank loans were not being paid. And if the bank loans are not being paid, then the bank resorts to its uh, to the security. So was it a co coincidence that this happened at the same time? No, I'm the... telling you, the politics were negative at that time. Yeah. Then everybody was pointing fingers. You know, there were lots of other things that were taking place at that time. Even countries and stopped releasing their, their earnings from the East African community agencies. You know, like the customs. 
comes customs and quarters was Kenya. Customs and harbors were in Kenya. So the earnings of the of, of those agencies were supposed to be sent to the headquarters and then redistributed using a certain formula. So everybody now started holding his own, his own earnings. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I told you now Tanzania has crossed the border. As it's shortened by crossing the border. So what, what do we expect people to do? The other thing was this issue of uh, the instability in Uganda where Tanzania was being accused of destabilizing Uganda by the Indian Amin. So, you know, this, what, what John just said, that there is no need of nursing something which is dying. That's, that was the issue. We cannot keep on babysitting. Uh, a baby who is not alive. Yeah, and, yes. and Kenya is accused of committing the initial acts of aggression. Uh, one of them was the, uh, apparently the Prime Minister of China, Chu Enlai, yes. could not be allowed to make a stopover in JKI. Where well, uh, coming from Tanzania? That, yeah, yes, and, and that's where... But that was not the immediate cause. The immediate cause was really the, the, the grounding of the highways. Mm -hmm. Tanzania was complaining about some of those things. But the issue was, um, you know, those were what we call the symptoms mm -hmm. of the tensions which were developing between the three countries. Actually, the country which is left holding even the community for quite some time was Kenya. Uh, yes. I'm most certain that uh, some of Kenyans watching you right now would want to ask what your thoughts would be on the balance between public service and the elected arm of uh, government because there are a lot of concerns about how that is being carried out currently uh, where basically elected and appointed is coming in to take over from what used to be traditional public service. You know, that would be a major mistake um, if, if you dilute the public service. You know, elected leaders have their role. Public service has its role. And the two roles are very distinct. Elected leaders are leading the country to develop. They are leading the country to greater peace. They are leading the country to more cooperation or more competitiveness. That is broad that is what you call is wasteful. They have set targets. But how to go there? The strategy of achieving those huge, big objectives is not the work of our politician. Because he's not capable of doing those things. It's professionals. It is the, is the engineers. Is the Political scientists, is the lawyers in the in the public service, is the doctors, is the you know is the is is the, is, is the industries, people in the industry, people in the private sector, people those are the people, the doers, politicians and dreamers, and those dreams are very important. So how does it make you feel uh, with what you just described? Uh, how does it make you feel, Ambassador, when you see? Um, former member of parliament losing elections then getting appointed a principal secretary which is what you used to call permanent secretary. Well, there are some who are capable, uh, who are qualified to do that because, you know, the, those people become permanent secretaries or who become politicians. Some of them are professionals or vice standing. Some of them have a lot of experiences in the private sector. Some have... Uh, international experience and become members of parliament. So th I'm not saying they are not capable. But what I'm saying is that um, these jobs, the success of any country is determined by the capacity and the, the, the you know, the, the, the capacity and the drive 
of the cabinet, that's their ministers. Whether well, the president is a member of the cabinet. And then drive of the top civil servants and also, also the quality of the business practices and the ethics in the business. This is my final question, Ambassador. Secrecy is the motif of a public servant. You keep a lot of secrets. Yes. You've written a book. How much have you not told us? Yeah, you know, the problem is um, sometimes the word secret is uh, overplayed. You don't keep information which is useful to the people, hidden and, uh, but any information which is useful to the people should be given out. So have you told us as much as you can on <laughs> moving the horizon? No, I don't think I've left much. I don't know whether I've left much. You know what you normally do is, uh, you know, the, what is sensitive is probably to identify weaknesses and uh, sometimes problems uh, with certain people. You know, sometimes people get about irritated about it. But we, we, we don't dwell with that. We dwell with the positive drive for the country. Thank you, Ambassador. It's the life and story of Ambassador Francis Kiribi Mudaura, now in a book, coming to your nearest bookshelf. And the book is A Moving Horizon by Ambassador Francis Mudaura. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.